Amen. You may be seated. We are delighted to have all of you with us tonight, and we are certainly pleased to welcome those of you who are visiting. Thanks for those of you who have come from very far, far away, and uh, we appreciate having your presence with us tonight. If you've never filled out one of our visitor registration forms, we encourage you to do so. Uh, they are found in the bulletins. I think Brother McCoy is looking for some of those right now, and we'll give them to you very shortly. We're in the book of Acts on our Sunday evening worship services. We're in Acts chapter 9, and we have been looking at the incredible events that God caused to happen in the early church. We see the beginnings of the church as we open the book of Acts. We see the wonderful day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit in a new and special way, doing new works and doing some incredible things to draw our Lord, our friends and neighbors to Jesus Christ, those in the early church and those today. Then we find, as we move through the book of Acts, the bold testimony of the apostles. We find the persecution arising after the death of Stephen, the first martyr in the church. And then we find the church being scattered abroad and uh, revival breaking out in Samaria. We've looked at some exciting events where God reached groups of people, where God reached individual people with the gospel, such as the Ethiopian eunuch. And now we have just finished the section dealing with the Apostle Paul, and we are about to move into a section dealing again with the ministry of Peter. You recall that last time in Acts chapter 9, verses 29 through 31, we saw peace at a price. We find the Apostle Paul not only preaching, but disputing. Uh, confrontational evangelism, if you will, in verses 29 through 31. And as the Jews go about to kill the Apostle Paul, it is known to the disciples, and they hastily escort him out of town. And then it says all the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Church growth, church growth God's way, not church growth through uh, all kinds of funny stories told by the a man in the pulpit, not church growth through feel-good theology, but church growth through the proclamation of the word in the face of great adversity. And those who are hearing listened to the dispute on both sides and came to the conclusion, by the grace of God, that what Paul said was the truth, and the church was multiplied. Wonderful, beautiful passage that tells us about the character of Saul, the character of the church, and the responsibilities of the church that they had for the man who had led them to Christ. We saw the methods that were used by God to establish peace and biblical church growth. We'll not go over all of those things tonight, but they are there in that passage. And so tonight we come to verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years, and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. The segment dealing with the ministry of Peter had finished in verse 31, immediately before this. And as we pick up in verse 32, dealing with the ministry of Peter, we'll discover in a few moments that the writer of the book of Acts does not just jump haphazardly into the ministry of Peter, but actually picks up where we left off the last time we saw Peter. The alternating history between the ministry of Peter and Paul is designed here for several reasons, and you see this as you move through the book of Acts. First of all, both men were involved in active ministry at the same time, but in different locations. Second, both men were gifted as apostles and the parallel ministries show their spiritual equality. Third, one man was the apostle to the Jews, that was Peter. 
The other is the apostle to the Gentiles, and he speaks of that with great favor, the apostle Paul. The miracles that Peter did, as recounted by the book of Acts, are also miracles done by the apostle Paul. And so we're seeing this balance between the two, the miracles that Peter did there in Acts. We see Paul doing them later on. Peter is compared individually to Paul. Rather interesting because the last time we saw Peter in the book of Acts, Peter and John were together up in Samaria. That was at Philip's Samaritan revival in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 and following. But by this time, as we reach this point in the book of Acts, God has given John apparently a distinct and different ministry from Peter, and so John is no longer under Peter's shadow, nor is he mentioned here in the text. It's also interesting that God chose not to give us additional specific information in the book of Acts about the ministry of John or about any of the other apostles for that matter. We have general information that they were still in Jerusalem in Acts 15 at the council there. But even there only Peter is mentioned by name among the apostles. However, the text speaks three times in Acts 15 about Paul and Barnabas, that they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. So we know the apostles were there in Acts chapter 15. We know that the apostles had further ministries from the epistles. But what we see taking place in the book of Acts is a transition, a transition in several ways, a transition from the old Jewish order where we have Jewish males being saved in Acts chapter 2. And then we have the Samaritan revival with those who are half Jewish and half Gentile, and both men and women are mentioned in Acts chapter 8, to the Ethiopian eunuch, also in Acts chapter 8, who is neither male nor female, but he is Jewish by religion and Gentile by birth. And then we move to those who are the oppressor nation, in Acts chapter 10, who are 100% Gentile, Cornelius and his household. So we see an entire family, not just men, not just men and women, but an entire household, which would have included children and infants as well. A rather exciting movement, this transition and this expansion as we move through the book of Acts until finally we reach those disciples of John who had been baptized with the baptism of John but had not heard that the Messiah actually had come, had been here for three and a half years, had been crucified, buried, and rose again, and ascended to heaven. And so when Paul finds them, he says, under what were you baptized? And they say, under the baptism of John. And so we find the last group, which is really a group of Old Testament believers looking forward to the coming of the Messiah brought in at that point in Ephesus. So the book of Acts is a transition into this new, wonderful, expanding order, which includes us, because most of us are Gentiles, which includes us in the one body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see a transition also in the ministry of Peter, who was the apostle to the Jews, to the ministry of the apostle Paul, who is the minister to the Gentiles. And thus we see this movement taking place here in our text tonight. Acts is a transition book. By the way, John Mark, who is mentioned later in the book of Acts, is not the Apostle John. The second thing that we learn is that Peter had an itinerant ministry for a short period of time, as contrasted with the other apostles who had remained behind in Jerusalem and are clearly still there in Acts chapter 15. You recall that Acts chapter 8 told us that all of the apostles had remained in Jerusalem when the church was scattered under the persecution that arose following the death of Stephen. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. However, the text tonight speaks of how Peter passed through all quarters and came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. That's in verse 32. We learn a number of lessons from this. First of all, that 
even men with the same gifts may be called to exercise different ministries at different times in their lives, which are different from other men who are equally gifted. We also learn some things about the location where Peter was and why it is important in our text. Lydda is a small town about 10 miles southeast of Joppa. If you drew a line connecting Jerusalem to Joppa, which is on the sea coast, which is to the northwest of Jerusalem, if you drew a straight line through there, Lydda would be on that line in the coastal plain, which is called the Shvela, just about 10 miles from Joppa and about 25 miles from Jerusalem. It's rather interesting, this is the general area where the original Lode Airport, some of you may have flown into Lode Airport many years ago, one of the earliest airports in the nation of Israel. Lida is Lod. That is what it is known as today. Rather interesting also to see some things that this was the area populated after the return from the Babylonian exile was populated by a particular type of people. This is where the ironsmiths and the skilled craftsmen, or in our terms the skilled middle class population, returned and began to live. As a result of the healing of the paralytic here in this particular passage, many people came to Christ in that area. Verse 25 says, And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Saron is Sharon in Hebrew, or Sharon as we would say in English. And it refers to the general vicinity around Lydda going both north and south along the coastal plain, along the Shvela area. Rather interesting, probably most of you have heard of the plain of Sharon, sort of uh, in our terms and the size of, say, a state like Texas, it would be like a very large county uh, in Texas with this Lida being sort of the county seat at the center of that. You've probably heard also of the Rose of Sharon. That's uh, actually cultivated there in that area and has been for centuries. The Rose of Sharon, it's a variety of St. John's wort. And uh, it grows in that area very prolifically, a beautiful flower with great yellow flowers on the plant. At one of the points in history, this was a very strong area of Christians. Interesting because it is located right next to one of the main trade routes going north and south up the coastal plain from Egypt all the way up into Phoenicia all the way up to Tyre, and all the way up further into what we now know as modern-day Turkey. It was a route of communication. It was a route whereby a great deal of trade and travel and, and commerce took place. And God chose to put a very important witness in that city. We see that as we move through the book of Acts, how God strategically placed people at different times in specific locations, and it is clearly the sovereign hand of God and God's timing in doing so, to make sure that there was a spread, a wide spread of the gospel throughout the ancient world. We saw that, for example, with the Ethiopian eunuch. As Philip is directed away from a great mass revival taking place, he's told to go down into the desert. He goes down toward Gaza. Meanwhile, there is a man of Ethiopia, a very great man, a man who is in charge of the entire treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. He is converted to Judaism. He has made a long trip all the way from Ethiopia in Africa, all the way up and all the way to Jerusalem while the revival is going on. He worships at Jerusalem. He turns back. He's traveling home, and at a precise moment, Philip, on foot, is walking that direction, crosses the path as the Ethiopian eunuch is going by, and it is precisely at that time that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53, and Philip hears him, and the Spirit says, go join yourself to that chariot. Dear friends, there is no accident in the plan of God. There are only incidents. There is nothing that happens outside of his sovereign control and his direct leading and intervention, particularly in the lives of those 
who walk by faith and who are trusting him. He directs our paths. He makes sure that the intersections of our lives are exactly such that he receives the greatest amount of glory and his word has the greatest proclamation. When we disobey, he can certainly change our course, as he did with a certain man who did not want to go to Assyria by the name of Jonah. And Jonah tried to run from the face of the Lord, and God gently redirected his path through a great storm in the belly of a fish and a pile of fish vomit on the shores where God told him, now continue on with the mission that I gave to you. You and I will do God's will one way or the other because God has designed to use his people as his witnesses. We have a responsibility, but we also have the empowerment and the grace of God to enable us to fulfill the ministry that God gives to each one of us. And so we find that it is not by accident that Peter comes to Lydda. It's rather interesting because of not only the trade routes that go that way, north and south, but it's also only about 25 miles from Shechem and Sychar and Jacob's well, where the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 4 met the woman at the well. It's from the area of Samaria, where the revival has just been taking place in the first part of of Acts chapter 8, there is road between the two. That ties us back to the events of Acts chapter 8 and explains why Peter and John were not in Jerusalem at that time. In Acts chapter 8, then, we find Simon, the magician, himself believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now it's rather interesting. Look at verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. That's the reason Peter and John are not in Jerusalem. That's the reason that they've been up in Samaria. And as we get to the end of that passage and after Peter excoriates Simon for his desire to purchase the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. It says in the final verse, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now there are several roads, as you know from our previous studies, that go from Samaria and get back to Jerusalem. Some of them go directly, some of them cross the Jordan River and come down the other side. Some of them go north and then cross the Jordan River and come down the other side. Some of them go over toward the coast. Was it any accident that the route God directed Peter to take was over toward the coast? At that point, he is going southwest, and he comes to Lydda, which is where this man was located. It's interesting to notice also that that there were already Christians at Lydda before Peter arrived. It says he came down also, and my notes are not printed very well here. I cannot hardly see them, so you'll have to forgive me for this. Um, and he discovered believers who were dwelling at Lydda. That's in verse 32. Now, it's possible that those could have been a result of Philip's revival in Samaria, but I think it's more likely that these were people who had fled from Jerusalem during the persecution Thus, they would have been familiar with who Peter was. They would also have been familiar with the ministry that he had and would have been, Peter would have been eager to look them up. We find here it says, It came to pass as Peter passed through all quarters, he also came down to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And it's there that he found Aeneas. Rather interesting, a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick, of the palsy. As we look at that, it means that while the revival in Samaria was going on, he had the palsy. He'd had that palsy, it says, for eight years. We find that God gave Peter a specific direction to reach one man. We find also some other very interesting things because <laughs> 
The Ethiopian eunuch had been on a, a long journey of hundreds of miles and he was strong and healthy and well, but this is a very short journey that Peter is taking. But God directs him to a man who could not have gone on a long journey. This man had been paralyzed. He was not able to go anywhere. In fact, he could not get out of bed for eight years. Now, I know some of us are slothful and we like to stay in bed for a while, but I think being in bed for eight years would get sort of tiring on any of us. Here's a man who had sat and waited. If our chronology of the book of Acts is correct, that means that this man had been seized with the palsy shortly before Jesus started his earthly ministry. Probably before John the Baptist started his ministry. And he'd lain in bed all through that time. He had been paralyzed during the crucifixion and the resurrection. He'd been paralyzed while all the excitement on the day of Pentecost was going on. He'd been paralyzed through the stoning of Stephen, through the period of time of persecution. And God had a purpose in that. Because there was going to be a specific time for him, just like the lame man in John chapter uh, in Acts chapter four. That lame man had lain at the temple for many years. He was forty years old. He'd been lame from his mother's womb. No doubt he had been in the temple at the time that Jesus came to the temple and went from the temple, and came from the temple, and went from the temple, and came from the temple, and went from the temple, and were told that Jesus healed people in the temple. But Jesus didn't heal that man at that time. Why not? Because God had chosen him for a specific moment and for the testimony of Christ so that when Peter and John went into the temple and this man looked at them hoping for an alms, Peter says unto him, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. And he leaped up and leaping and walking and praising God went before them into the temple. This was a man who was known to all the Jews who came into the temple day after day after day after day. And as a result, the crowd gathered and Peter was able to say, listen, it's not by our power that we did this, but it's by the name of Jesus Christ. And huge numbers were saved. You know, this man Aeneas, it appears that he was well known because it says, this was known to all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron. They saw him and turned to the Lord. This man Aeneas, for some reason, was known to the people of that region, not merely that little town, but of the entire region. And because they saw him, they had visible proof, they turned to the Lord. Never consider yourself too small, too insignificant, too weak, too helpless to be used of the Lord. It's not your power or my power by which Christ is exalted. It is by his power that the name of Christ is glorified. And I think we see that very clearly here with this man. He was, the eunuch was a very important man in his time. Aeneas was a very unimportant, a nobody in human terms. But isn't it interesting, we do not know the name of the Ethiopian eunuch but we know the name of the paralytic. A name that God has chosen to have recorded in the scriptures for all of eternity. He put that man there, brought him through what no doubt was a emotionally, if not physically, desperate time of life. So that at one particular point, God could do something in his life that would affect an entire region, which then was solidly Christian for many centuries. Would you like to be used by God? He might use you as he did with the Ethiopian eunuch who brought Christianity to Ethiopia and who was strong and healthy and well and rich and powerful 
though he could have no children. Or he might use you like he did with Aeneas, who thought things were hopeless. I suspect there were many days when he woke up and he thought, Oh Lord, why don't you take me home? You know, I've visited with many people who have been in terminal conditions. Many hospital visits, many visits in retirement centers and nursing homes. Visits with people who are very elderly. And they say, Pastor, why doesn't the Lord just take me home? I so much yearn for heaven. And they're ready to go. God does not make mistakes. God does not forget that we're there. God does not say, well, I'm busy working with some other people whom I, whom I really getting a lot done through them. The reason God leaves us here is because he still has a purpose for us. Paul understood the struggle. He said, I'd rather depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it's more needful for me to remain here because I have a ministry with you all. Why does God have you here? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why does God have you here? Not merely here tonight at Collingswood Bible Presbyterian Church, but why does he keep you alive? I think if most of us were honest with ourselves, there is no you know, human reason that we ought to be staying here. We'd rather be in heaven, I think all of us would, unless our heart is not in the right place. If you'd rather be here on earth because of money or family or friends or something you plan that you want to do or something else, it means that your eyes are not on Jesus. But God has a purpose for you. Some of us live a long time. Some of us live very short lives. The question is, how are you using your life for Jesus? Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. When you're going through a difficult time, think about Aeneas. When you're going through a difficult time that seems to drag on and drag on and drag on and there doesn't seem to be any end in sight and it's just the same old, same old, same old monotonous pain and helplessness and feeling of worthlessness and uselessness. If you ever go through that, remember Aeneas. God has a purpose for you every moment that you are alive to bring glory to Christ. I have a friend who is totally paralyzed. He had a stroke. He's only slightly older than I am, but he had that stroke about 10 years ago. He has a brother who cares for him faithfully every day. He cannot move. He cannot speak. But his mind is still there, and he can hear and see, and he can move his eyes. He can signal yes with an upward tilt of the eyes and no with a downward tilt. His brother has discovered that by taking a plexiglass sheet with letters on it, and by touching the letters, the paralyzed brother can move his eyes up when you reach the right letter and spell out sentences and communicate. Now someone might think, what a horrible way to live. Do you know this man has a very important ministry? Years ago when he was still strong and healthy and well and I was pastoring a church in North Jersey and he and his brother would come down out of New York State to visit and attend services he had developed a ministry of prayer, in particular, prayer for those in authority over us. Each of the 16 different people who in chain of command are in authority over us, all the way up to the United States, the president. He developed that and spread it through many churches all over the United States. 
He had a ministry of prayer four, five, six hours a day for individual prayer requests, for people on the mission field, for pastors, for Sunday school teachers, for people for whom he was praying to receive Christ. He had a ministry to children where he gave them Bibles in large print. He can no longer pass out those Bibles, but he can still pray, and he does. And every time I'm through his area, I stop at his home and pray with him. And he asks by means of his eyes for new requests. Is he useless in the sight of God? Is he helpless? Or does he have a ministry which is probably far greater than the ministry of any one of us sitting in this auditorium tonight? His is a life of prayer. Every waking moment he is praying or listening to the scriptures which his brother plays for him on a tape recorder. Dear people, as long as you are alive, you never reach a state of uselessness. When you come to a point whereby you think you are in despair, remember Aeneas and the spread of the gospel that came as a result of God reaching down and touching his life. I think it is a beautiful and a powerful, very powerful picture. He did not complain about his condition. He did not say, God, why do I have to suffer so helplessly for eight years? He never asked as far as we know. Interesting that he had what's called the palsy here. Paralutikos. That's to loosen. We already saw that disease described in Acts chapter 8 verse 7 where it happened to be one of the very very prevalent diseases in Samaria and we talked about that in some detail the principal problem in that area around Samaria whether it was genetic or environmental and we discussed the different genetic diseases of Samaria even today and some that were mentioned there in that passage at that time and many were taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And here we find a man not too far away from there. And as Peter is returning from the Samaritan revival where many paralytics were healed, here's a paralytic that didn't manage to get in on it, just like the lame man in John chapter 4 didn't get in on the healing miracles that Jesus did in the temple. Dear people, God cares about individuals. God never misses any of us. God cares about you personally. The only kind of God that can do that is a God who is infinite, a God who is all wise, a God who is all compassion and love, and a God who attends to the details. And he will attend to the details in your life as you walk with him. The Bible tells us that Peter found him. He did not have someone go searching for Peter. The sovereignty of God will never bypass someone whom God intends to touch. Peter didn't do any fancy magic. He merely spoke a word with authority. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. He didn't say, I'm here to let you know that if you have enough faith and if I sprinkle you with enough water and slap you on the back and you are slain in the spirit, you will be made whole. He didn't say any of that. He said, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. To the point. And then he gives a command, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. As we look at this text here, Peter is stating a personal fact, Aeneas, and then he gives a direct command, and Aeneas is healed. 
Notice that his healing required an active response. Peter says to him, get up and make your bed. Now Aeneas did not just weakly stagger up and then collapse. He got up, rolled up his mat. They didn't have beds like we have, you know, queen-size mattress with a box spring and a headboard and a, a footboard. Rolled up his mat, he started moving. And of course that parallels the miracle of our Lord Jesus Christ recorded in all four Gospels. That is significant. In Matthew and chapter 9, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, same word, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, skipping a few verses, he saith to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. Same kind of command that we find Peter giving to Aeneas in the book of Acts. This is also recorded in Mark chapter 2. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And so we find our Lord Jesus Christ performing that miracle in Mark chapter 2. We find it in the Gospel of Luke. And the men brought a bed, a man who was taken with the palsy, and they sought by means by which to bring him in and lay him before him. And of course, Jesus then tells him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. John records it, in fact, gives a more extended a discussion of that incident where Jesus says unto him, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And that is one of the Sabbath confrontations that Jesus has in the Gospel of John because it tells us, And the same day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews see him carrying his bedroll. They say, What in the world are you doing? You're doing work on the Sabbath. You're carrying your bedroll. He says, well, the man who just healed me told me I'm supposed to pick up my bed and go someplace with it, go home. And it's one of the reasons that they wanted to kill Jesus. Isn't that amazing? After doing an incredible miracle, they see a man and they are petty about you're carrying your bedroll on the Sabbath day. How often do we miss the point? It is not without significance that this is one of the few miracles which is recorded by all four of the Gospels. Only a few things are recorded in all four Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have many of the same things in them, some more extended than others, but contain many of the same events, and that's why they're called Synoptic. They see together. The Gospel of John chooses out specific miracles which John refers to as signs which specifically point to Jesus and which fulfill the purpose of the gospel given to us in the final chapter. Many other miracles did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's the purpose of the signs in the gospel of John. And this is one of those signs, one of those miracles that Jesus did, which is recorded by all three of the synoptics and also by the Gospel of John. When God does that, it's because he wants to really draw our attention to what's going on. And so this is a miracle that we see now taking place as Peter finds Aeneas and tells him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, take up thy bed, and go home. God is telling us that there is no sickness too difficult for him to heal. We don't have the gifts of apostle today. We don't have the gifts of prophet or healings or miracles. Those were sign gifts given in the early church. But God still heals in answer to prayer. God may choose not to heal as well. He is under no obligation to perform a physical miracle on my behalf or on your behalf. But many times he allows us to go through those difficult times of disease in our lives so that it will turn our hearts back to him, back to the Lord Jesus. Aeneas is apparently well-known and had a very clear and open 
visible testimony. Verse 35. And all that dwelt in Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. When he arose from his bed, he didn't say, wow, I've got a lot of stuff around the house here that I'd like to take care of. I haven't cleaned the dishes for the last eight years. And you know, I've been looking at that cobweb over in the corner for eight years. I'm going to get my broom and I'm going to sweep it out. <laughs> they saw him. That means he left his house. They saw him. That means he walked down the street of Lydda. But all Saran saw him. That means he went up and down the territory where they could see him and he gave his testimony of what Jesus Christ had done in his life. Dear people, that's what God's called us to do. Not to sit at home and putter with stuff, but to openly, visibly, joyfully, and I am sure he was happy, <laughs> proclaim Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Has he done anything for you? Say, well, I can't remember the last time. Then, friends, if you can't remember what he did for you this morning, and yesterday, and earlier in this week, and the grace that he poured out in your life, and something for which to give him praise, then perhaps you're not walking with the Lord. Perhaps you don't even know him. Oh, friend, the good news is that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. We have just celebrated this last week. And it is by faith in him alone that he will raise you from the dead, raise you from your paralysis, raise you from all the gunk that clutters your life, and give you new life, and exuberance, and a servant's heart for loving him and for serving him. Do you get discouraged? Do you get depressed? Do you think that you're helpless and that you're hopeless and that God couldn't possibly have anything to do with you? Remember Aeneas. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the excitement and thrill that we see as we see the early church, the apostles, the others, in spite of persecution, in spite of oppression, moving forward with the gospel of Christ, taking each day as it came and fulfilling what you called them to do. And Father, you have given to us life in Christ as well. We pray that you will give each one of us the energy, the joy, the determination, the motivation, the drive, to serve Jesus Christ with every moment of our life, never to get discouraged, never to get downhearted, never to give up, never to think that we are too small, too weak, too poor, too useless, too helpless to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. When you touch our lives, Father, you are the one that makes the difference, and what a difference you make. How we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.